1, the Bible reads, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. Listen to this, verse 3. The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. We're going to talk about integrity tonight, and specifically the value of integrity in leadership, and the importance of being a leader with integrity, of doing the right thing. I want you to turn to Job chapter 2. You can hardly talk about integrity in a biblical sense without talking about the man Job. Job, it is said of more than any other man in the Bible, had integrity. He's a good example of somebody with integrity. And, you know, you are a leader and a follower. There's every one of us in here has someone over us and someone under us. And as a leader, we need to make sure we have integrity at all times. And sometimes that means we have to make hard calls. We have to call shots that others may not see or agree or understand. But it's important that we always do the right thing, the ethical thing, the best thing according to what, what decisions you have to make. So we're talking about the value of integrity in leadership. And God has ordained leaders to all of us in life. It's God's will that we all have someone we answer to. Even as a New Testament church, the head of this church is the Bible. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And we answer to what He says. We do what He says. He's the boss. He's told us how to run things, and that's how we're going to do it. Right? Christ is our boss. We are called Christians. Right? You, even if you say, well, I fall out of church. Hey, you're still a Christian. You're a little Christ. You ought to do what He said. You ought to follow Him. That's the goal is to follow Christ. And God has ordained leaders in our life and different aspects of life to teach us how to become leaders ourselves. You know, in Romans chapter 13, it says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. He's saying you have somebody over you in some way, in some aspect of your life, and if you resist that, if you kick at that, then you're not going to learn the lessons you need to learn. Right? You will be a better leader when you learn to be a better, better follower. And listen, you know, you, uh, take this application to the house. If the wife says, well, I just don't like my husband. God gave me this husband. I don't like him. We're well, going against God's will. Right? Man, while you're at work, you, know, you say, well, I just don't like my boss. I can do it better. I'm smarter than him. I'm, I'm smoother than him. I'm better looking. Well, then you're being rebellious. Right? God has set that boss over you for a reason to learn something from him. And we as individuals learn, need to learn how to have more integrity in life. And the more integrity we have, the better leader we'll be in all aspects of life. The definition of integrity, if you just look at a dictionary definition, it says, the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness. Strong moral principles saying, hey, this is what I will do, this is what I will not do, and I'm not going to cross those lines. I'm not going to blur those lines. I'm always going to try to do the best thing, the most ethical thing, the right thing, even when it hurts. You know, doing the right thing when it hurts is not popular in the world. You look at how many broken families there are today where the dad just, well, you know what? I'm gone. I want to have fun. I'm more worried about work. I'm more worried about getting that red sports car. And, you know, I don't like hearing babies cry. I'm going to go chase some, some other desire in my life. And they forsake their family. They don't do the right thing. You know, the Bible says that we need to do the right thing when it, when it, even when it hurts. You know, we need to be concerned for all, not just for yourself. Could you imagine if your family budget wasn't working? Can you imagine if, let's say your budget, uh-oh, we don't have enough money this month for groceries. Sorry, honey, we're not, we, I don't know how we're going to eat this week. We don't have any money. But you have $5 in your pocket, and you sneak out and go get you some McDonald's. Well, and you come, well sorry, kids, there's no food for you. Right? That wouldn't be a leader with integrity. The leader with integrity would say, hey, let's get some rice, let's get some beans, let's feed the kids first, you know, we'll worry about ourselves later. Right? A leader would put other people before themselves and do the right thing in the right situation. Amen. You're in Job chapter 2. Look at verse number 1. Job chapter 2, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Now, I just have to touch on it because it's here. Sons of God are believers everywhere you look it up in the Bible. 
God judged the earth in Genesis 6 because the believers were not standing on right things. They were doing the wrong things. They were unequally yoked. God destroyed them. He did the same thing in Ezra, Nehemiah's day. And here we see, uh, it's talking about children of God, and here comes the devil. Listen, when a church has a weakness, the devil's going to try to come in. When your family has a weakness, the devil's going to try to find some way in, some way to try to hurt somebody. And we always have to be vigilant. We have to be on guard of that. So Satan comes in. Look at verse number 2. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? Now notice, and you probably know this, this is the second time Satan's coming back again. Chapter 1, we see a similar dialogue, right? He says, hey, have you considered Job? There's, there's none like him in the earth. Like, he is a great man of God. And that would to God that he would look on us with that same attitude, right? And look at, look at, how, look at how this plays out. Verse, where are we at? Verse number 3. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God, and escheweth evil. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him, to destroy him without cause. So he says perfect. That means complete. In the King James Bible, when it says perfect of a Christian, of a believer, that is somebody that is complete. That doesn't mean they're sinless. That means they're in God's will. They're getting the sin out of their life as they ought to. Hey, they're still going to fall, and they're going to get up. They're going to confess their faults and be forgiven and move on with life. But notice it calls him an upright man. Now, now what we started in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 3, it says, The integrity of the upright shall guide them. The integrity of the upright shall guide them. The goal is to try to be a more perfect Christian so when you get in a bad situation like Job, your integrity will guide you. And you will know that you are making the best decision for everybody involved and not just yourself. Because the world's solution is, well, what feels best to you? What do you think you need to do? You do that and forget about everybody else. And that's a wicked attitude. Here it says he's perfect, he's upright, he fears God. His decisions, he's afraid of making the wrong decision because he knows God has the power to take the breath out of his lungs at any moment. Right? He says, and escheweth evil. He says, get away from me, evil. Oh, you want to work wicked? Get out of me. I don't want you in my sight. I'll set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. He says, he holdeth fast his integrity. Now, Job just lost, if you will, millions of dollars. Right? He just lost 10 grown children, dead, gone. He lost his crops. He lost his herds. He lost his employees. Right? He probably lost his reputation, but he did not lose his integrity. He was a man of God. He was upright. He did the right thing. Go back one chapter, Job chapter 1. Look at verse number 20. Job 1, verse number 20. This is when all the news hits. Look what Job does. It says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Job lost everything. Job was probably at the lowest point in his life that he's ever been. And what did he do? He worshipped God. He honored God in his heart. He did the right thing. Look at verse 21. And said... Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. This is the important lesson of an upright man, what to do in integrity. I lost all my stuff. I lost some person. Lord, why are you taking somebody from me? That's what I wanted. He said, no, God, I'm not going to charge you. God, you gave me that person. You gave me these things. You gave me these riches and power. And if you see fit to take it, so be it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I came into this world having nothing, and I will leave this world having nothing. Right? I used to work for a funeral home, and there, there was that joke. You ever seen a U-Haul trailer behind the hearse? Right? I'm saved. I'm storing up all these riches. I've got to get all this stuff. Why? So, what, you can bury it in a hole with you? It doesn't do you any good, right? The riches we grow on this earth do not last. The riches we get by preaching the gospel will last forever. Amen. You will rule and reign with God according to what you do now on this earth. According to your decisions and the time you invest in spiritual things, in other people, then you will have a great reward in the Lord's kingdom. You will rule and reign 
with him, he will put you over cities. Look, at, look back at Job chapter 2. Look at verse number 4. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath he will give for his life. There's a true statement there. People work their entire life and they get to a point where they, you know, to get all these riches, they get to a point they give all the riches just to maintain a little bit of life, to maintain a little bit of health. Look at verse 5. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse thee to thy face. He's saying, hey, make him hurt. Make him have pain. Give him a sickness. Give him something that hurts in the flesh and he'll stop serving you. He'll even curse you to his face. He won't obey your commandments. And look, the devil's onto something here. He wants to get us at our weakest moment. When you're sick, when you're down, when you're wore out, when you're tired, the devil will try to attack you. The devil will try to tempt you. He will put something in front of you. They will whisper in your ear. Look, resist the devil and he will flee from you. God gives us power to overcome these things. Look at verse number six. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. Right? In other words, he had leprosy or some sort of skin boils that were you know, boiling up and popping. Has anybody ever had poison ivy? Anybody ever had? Okay. I had poison ivy one time. It was so bad, my arm was twice the size. I had to stop working. I had to take a week off of work. I was, I was using a machete in a tree and there was poison ivy in it. I didn't see it. I was up on a ladder on a phone pole and I'm just cutting through poison ivy and my arm already had a nick. It was already cut. So not only did I get poison ivy on the skin, it got inside. It was, it was terrible. I, I found a picture of it recently when I changed phones and it, was, it looked like leprosy. It's one of the most disgusting things. You can ask my wife. She wouldn't let me touch the baby. She wouldn't give me any kisses. You know, it was a rough week, rough couple weeks. But they had to give me all this special ointment and all these steroids and all this, right? And just that little bit of my arm completely put me out of service. I couldn't work for my family. I couldn't hardly sit down without it hurting because my arm was just all swollen and hurting and pussy and just oozing. It was, it was terrible, right? Imagine this, Job now, the devil comes after destroying all of his resources and family and, and riches. And then he says, okay, let me make you hurt on every inch of your body because I bet you'll curse God. Right? This is the devil really trying to get let me hurt here, hurt there. Right? And, and look what Job does. It hurts so bad. Look what he does. Verse number 8. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all. And he sat down among the ashes. A potsherd is a shard or a piece of a pot. Imagine broken pottery. Imagine taking a, a piece of clay that hurt, you know, and scraping because it hurts. When you get poison ivy or something or an ant bite, it itches, right? It makes it feel a little bit better, but you're actually making it worse. That was Job's situation where he's scraping himself to relieve the pain. What a miserable situation he was in. What a terrible situation. But listen, you know, what we started with the, in Proverbs chapter 11, the integrity of the upright shall guide them. Look at Job's response. Look at verse number 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. She's saying, why are you still being upright? Why are you still keeping your integrity? Why don't you just curse God and let him kill you and get it over with? Right? It's almost like a quick judgment. You know, like some criminals will do a suicide by cop. You know, they pretend they have a gun just so they kill it because they don't want to kill themselves. You know what I mean? That's kind of like threatening God. Okay, God, I, I'm, I, I'm out of here. Let me just curse you and you'll take me out, you know. But he knew better than that. He knew that that didn't matter, that his flesh was temporary. We see as the story plays out, he says, in this flesh, I will stand up, right? I will see his redeemer, he talked about. Worms will destroy this body. But he knew that he would be resurrected. He knew about eternity to come. He knew about the kingdom of God. Look at verse 10. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. Go to Psalm 15. So in the worst situation he's ever been, and then it gets worse, and what's he say? God's given us good, and guess what? God's going to hurt us a little too sometimes. God allowed me to be hurt. He didn't falsely accuse God. He didn't charge God foolishly and say, God, why are you doing this to me? Instead, he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. 
God, I'm still alive. God's not done with me. There's something else here. I don't know what it is, so I'm going to maintain my integrity. I'm going to do the right thing. Job is a great example of a man that did the right thing in a terrible situation. You know, and he maintained his trust in the Lord. He did not give up on his relationship with God. He didn't stop being a Christian or go back to his worldly ways. He kept saying the right things. Even when his friends came and falsely accused him of all that stuff, he gave them an answer. He told them to their face they were wrong. He was rebuking them. You know, and when our earthly status changes in this life, will we still maintain our spiritual growth? This is the lesson here of integrity. When you go through a hard time, are you still going to grow spiritually? Are you going to determine in your heart, are you going to purpose in yourself that I'm still moving forward, I'm still going to grow for God, I'm still going to serve, I don't care what the circumstances are. Listen, you never know when your life may change. What if you lose a loved one? What if you lose a business? What if you lose your job? What if you lose your house? What if circumstances cause you to be picked up and moved to another city? Are you going to maintain your integrity and still serve God? Are you going to focus on having spiritual growth? You're in Psalm chapter 15. Look at verse number 1. A Psalm of David. O Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He's saying, Lord, who's going to reign with you? Lord, who's going to be with you in heaven? What type of people ought we to be as Christians? Look at verse 2. He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He doesn't just say the right thing. He believes the right thing. He speaks the truth in his own heart. He's not a double-minded person. He's not, you know, well, I'll just tell them one thing, but I believe. He says what it is. You know, he says what he believes is the truth. He maintains his integrity. Look at verse 3. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Look, instead of tearing your neighbor down, instead of tearing your brother down, sometimes it's good to just shut your mouth. Sometimes it's good to try to help them. We talked about this, who, who was it? Somebody was just talking about running into somebody that was, uh, that asked if, oh, you, oh, Baptist church, oh, you guys probably don't like homos, do you? Yeah, you know. It was you, was it? Yeah. Right? I had a similar situation with one of my neighbors, and I was trying to invite her to church. She already knew I was a pastor, or, or a preacher. Oh, you're, you got that church, right? Okay, let me, uh, uh, wh where are you at? What kind of, oh, Baptist. I used to go to a Baptist. Oh, okay. But I don't like them anymore. Why not? Now, me, my, my, my attitude, let me solve the problem. Let's help this person. Let's get them fixed, right? Let's get them, if they're probably, I'll figure she wasn't saved by what she was saying. Let me get her saved. Let me get her on fire. Maybe we can help this old lady. And, well, you know, my son, he went gay, and then they didn't want him in the Sunday school anymore. And I said, oh, okay. I, I didn't feel a need to start a fight with my neighbor and just start, well, you know what? You old, you know, you raised up a bunch of, no, 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 no. It wasn't wise, you know, and so I didn't do all that. Instead, I, okay, well, you have a great day. We'll see you later. And I walked on down the road. What's he saying here? Nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. If it's not necessary, don't pick a fight with your neighbor. Live at peace with those around you, right? That ought to be the reputation of a Christian. If your neighbor hates you for something, you need to find a way to make peace with them. Bake some cookies. Tell, you know, I mean, mow the lawn for them. Do something. Help them out. Try to win them over. Look at verse 4. Psalm 15, 4, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. Right? So what's he saying? What type of Christian ought we to be? Who will dwell with the Lord in his holy hill? Somebody that hates the wicked, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, hated. Right? An abomination in their eyes. He says, and honoreth them that fear the Lord. I may mention this in a past sermon. I, I met this other pastor that's an old IFB pastor, and his doctrine's right. I, I looked him up on YouTube. I mean, there's several old sermons. He's preaching against the Sodomites. It's like, wow, where is he? But he was wore out. I mean, I feel for that guy. I'm praying for that guy. I want to I help that guy if I can. I, I, I want to go soul winning with him sometime and talk to him and encourage him to stay in the fight. Look, I love those that fear the Lord. I don't care if you have my label or not. I don't care if you are in our movement or not. If you're saved and you fear the Lord and you love God, man, I want to help you out. I, I want to help you in whatever way I can. Look at the rest of this verse though here. It says, He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. What kind of person does God want us to be as Christians to maintain our integrity? One that swears to his own hurt and changes not. Now, first of all, swear not. But 
If you say, hey, Brother Fannin, I'm coming Saturday. I'm going to help you put that sign up. I'm going to help you pay. I'm going to do all this stuff. I promise, I promise, I promise. Well, you've sworn, and then you find out, uh-oh, I promised my wife I was going to mow the lawn. I was going to clean out. The well, you've sworn, you made, you know, see, this is why you don't swear, number one. You say, I'll do my best. Lord willing, I'll be there, right? But when you swear something, even if it hurts, you change not. You don't change your mind. Oh, I'm, don't you know the conditions? Well, it's a little bit rainy today, so I changed my mind. I'm not coming. Right? When you say you're going to do something, your word should be bond. It should be gold. I, sh I should be able to put in the bank. Your boss, when he says, hey, will you be there tomorrow? You say, yes, sir, I'll be there. You get sick at night. You're throwing up all night. And you in the morning, here you are on two hours of sleep, and your nose is running, and you don't know if you need to get, have, how close to be to a bathroom. You still go to work, and you do what you said you're going to do. And then if the boss wants to make a judgment call, say, man, go on home. Let him do that. Don't phone in. Amen. You know what I'm saying? I mean, look, we ought to have integrity. When we swear something and it's to our own hurt, it's to our own disadvantage, it's not pleasant or pleasing that we have to do. Hey, keep your word. Amen. Do what's right in the situation. Right. Look at verse number five. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. You want to be successful as a Christian? You want to maintain your integrity and be upright in this world? Make sure you're not trying to make money off the backs of other people. Make sure that you're trying to be honest with your financial dealings. Make sure that you're not hurting the innocent and you'll never be moved. Go back to Proverbs chapter 11 where we're at. Proverbs chapter 11. So we need to lead by example. We are all leaders in one fashion or another. And we need to strive to do the right thing even when it hurts. You know, I've been on job sites before where I had to get out of the way so the job could get done. Well, wait, do we do it like this? Do we, here, I'm sorry, let me move. Let's make sure the job gets done. Right, there's a time and a place to let your pride go, humble yourself for the benefit of the others, and just say, what do we need to do to make sure this happens the right way? Well, let me step out of the way so the job can get done. Right, sometimes that's very humbling, but, you know, pride goes before destruction, right? I mean, today, people are so puffed up, I can do it, I'll figure it out, and then it gets done wrong, and it has to be redone. You know, why not get out of the way and let it do right? Look, leaders are in our life to teach us how to follow. Leaders are in our life to teach us how to follow. Men, it's your responsibility to teach your wife how to be loving, forgiving, long-suffering, merciful, and you're supposed to do it with authority. This is very important. Look, your marriage relationship is the most important thing you have. And leaders in the church are here to help us to learn how to be good church members. You know, I thank God for Pastor Romero. There's a lot of things I've learned from him. And one of the things he said to me, then I don't know if, he, if it was original with him or he got it from somebody else, but it really stuck with me, was the type of church member that I am is the type of church members that I will have. And you think about that. When I showed up to Fort Worth, man, I was like, I want to help. What are you doing? Let me, let me help. Give me something. You know, it's funny. I, I just, I haven't wore this jacket in a while, and I pulled out an old uh, password that he gave me to YouTube so I could help him with some stuff. I, I pulled out an old sheet from the anniversary thing, and, and it just had me reminiscing about the fact that he, that he had such a burden. I said, here, let me help. Let me do what I can. And I'm blessed to say that here in Jacksonville, I've got a lot of men that have the same attitude. I, that I have more people asking me to do stuff than I have stuff that needs to be done. And that's awesome. You know, we need to be good followers first of a righteous leader and then God will help you be a better leader. You should teach your wife how to follow by doing the right thing, man. Listen, when, and don't, well, she, you don't understand. She does it. No, no. It's up to you. The buck stops with you. If your family fails, it's your fault, dad, and you need to fix it. You're the only one that can fix it. Mom can't fix you, but you can sure fix her by changing things around. And this is very important. I mean, church family is, is essentially a picture of what we have in the church. Uh, you're in Proverbs chapter 11. Look at verse number 12. He that is void of wisdom despiseth his neighbor, but a man of understanding holdeth his peace. Now it's interesting, this goes along with what we just read in Proverbs 15. He that is void of wisdom despiseth his neighbor. I want you to hold your place here in Proverbs 11 and go to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19. We referenced Leviticus 19 in this past Sunday a.m. and p.m. services, so I, I thought it was fitting. We'll just go here now because it tells us how to not despise our neighbor. 
How to make sure that we ourselves are a good ma a neighbor. Notice he says, a man of understanding holdeth his peace. There is a time to not make war with people. Hey, there is a time for war, and there is a time for peace. And a wise man can discern when and where. So how do, how do we become a great example of what a Christian ought to be? It's by humbling ourselves, not being selfish, right? Serving others in leadership. Look, we're not here to make enemies. And I, I know, you know we have some controversial doctrines, and it always seems like we're talking about certain groups, and we're fighting certain groups. And listen, it's necessary to rebuke them in the gate and talk about these false prophets and the sodomites and the weirdos. We're going to stand against them, but we're not here to make enemies. Goal number one is to make friends. No, it's, the, it's to make brothers and sisters. Goal number one is to go out and preach the gospel to the lost, get them saved, get them on fire, get them baptized, and get them discipled. Teach them all things. That's our, that is our goal. That is our purpose as a church. It's not just to stand against, although that's part of it. We have to have a defense. That's what the other churches don't have. We are standing for soul winning. The purpose of this church is to go out and preach the gospel and bring people in and help them become Christians and disciples. That's our purpose on this. And we can't forget that. You know, and Jesus warned us about hypocrisy and we need to judge ourselves and make sure that we keep the right motivation. That's how we be a good neighbor. That's how we teach integrity and leadership. You're in Leviticus 19. Look at verse number 11. Ye shall not steal neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. And ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. So he says it like four ways. Don't lie. Let your word be your word. That's integrity. When you say, I'm going to do something, you do it. And when you have to do something different, you, you be honest in every situation that you can. You, you do the ethical thing. Look at verse 13. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. Don't trick your neighbor out of something. Don't defraud your neighbor. Don't move the fence line, right? But notice, he brings, he brings it into wages. You know, I've seen employees that, well, I'll pay you tomorrow. Well, I'll pay you next week. Well, that's no fun. That's not right. I work this week. I should get paid this week. Especially if you have the money and you withhold the money. God says, as an employer, that's wrong. As a leader, that is. That's wicked. That's wrong. And a lot of us have probably been victims of bosses like that. Right. But as Christians, we need to do the opposite. Hey, as a Christian, if you need to, and I've had to do this, I need to hold a check. I guess I'll hold my check and I'll pay my people. That's integrity. That's the right thing to do. I, I can make it till Monday. I don't know if they can, though. So I'm going to pay my people so they're there on Monday. Not just angry, but there to work and be happy. Right? As a Christian, we need to lead by example, and that's by having integrity and not lying, not dealing falsely, not defrauding. We need to judge ourselves here. We need to be honest as a boss. Look at verse number 17. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart, Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Now look, this is very important. How do we love our neighbor? We tell him when he's wrong. We rebuke them. I'm not going to suffer you to be in sin. I had an employee one time that stole some stuff while he was working for me. He was still on my property. I caught him. I didn't just let it slide. I rebuked him. I told him that was wrong. I could have fired him. Later I had to. Right? But I, I didn't just, oh, it's okay. It's no big deal. Oh, you were joking? That's not, it, it doesn't work that way. We are commanded to rebuke. Right? You remember in Luke chapter 17, we read that where it says, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. If he repent, forgive him. That's how it ought to work. A give-take relationship. And here he's saying, how do you not suffer sin on your neighbor? I don't want my neighbor to be in sin. I rebuke him when it's wrong. Right? That's how we love our neighbor. That's part of it. Look at verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Integrity is to love others more than yourself. That's very important. Listen, as, as, as parents, as husbands, your family comes first. Your boss comes second, right? And this is God's order. I'm not put, taking God out of the first position. I'm telling you, if you love God, you're going to keep his word. He says you need to put your wife above all others. You need to put your wife above your boss. That's very important. 
Your family comes first. That's your first responsibility. But to love our neighbor is to not avenge or bear a grudge. You know, sometimes in, with family and Christian brothers and sisters, we need to make sure we're forgiving as we ought to. In Philippians 2, he says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Right? You know, we've had, we've had uh, several events, you know, potlucks and pizzas and stuff here. Could you imagine if everybody just rudely, okay, I'm first, let me in there. I'm getting what I want. I want the ones with pineapple on it. You can have it, you know. <laughs> right? could you, but could you imagine if we were all rude? It wouldn't work. It wouldn't be any good. You know, we need to humble ourselves. We esteem others better than ourselves and stand back. Y'all go ahead. Y'all go ahead. Y'all go ahead. So, so finally, nobody's going, all right, I'm going. Right? <laughs> But the goal here as a Christian, how do you know when you're demonstrating that Christian love to your neighbor? It's by putting them above you, right? It's, it's by putting your wife above you. It's by putting your boss above yourself when he's asking you to do a difficult thing. Well, I don't want to do the difficult thing. Well, you know what? He's my boss. I'm going to tell him. I'm going to do what he wants. We're going to do it right. I'm going to keep my integrity. Look at verse number 16. Take a step back here. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. This is very important. Hey, don't be running your mouth on Facebook about stuff. Don't be gossiping about people. Don't run up and down as a talebearer saying stuff you don't know that's so. Man, this is so important today because, you know, we are really in a, in a, in a new age of technology where people, I mean, how many times, and everybody has seen it. You go to a restaurant, there's a, a table full of people staring at their phones and not each other. They won't talk to their family, but they'll talk to people they don't know as if they're friends, right? Listen, it's created, it really has hurt us socially. We don't know how to interact with people. Our priorities have changed. I got to check the phone first. I mean, check the family first. Check the wife first. Check the husband first. Check on the kids. Hey, leave me alone. I'm, doing so, I'm, I'm trying to get my status update. I'm trying to upload these new selfies, right? Facebook and social media in a lot of ways is hurting just the way that we interact with each other, and we still don't yet see how it's all playing out. Right? It's changing slowly over time. If you consider it, the cell phone itself is just less, I mean, I mean the, 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 it really, the smartphone, more accurately, is barely a decade old. Right? For barely a decade, we've had a smartphone where you can really browse the internet and watch videos and look at pictures in real time and things like that, stream live and look at stuff that's live. This is all very brand new technology. And it is, I think it, it's fracturing a lot of relationships. I think it's damaging a lot of families and friendships. And everybody has some artificial friendship. And this is very dangerous because he's saying here, don't go up and down as a tail bearer among my people. And that's what Facebook's all about. There, oh, there's some drama? Man, let me get in on that. Let me fire a shot. There's 300 comments on this thread. I want to put one in. Maybe they'll like what I said. Maybe I'll change their mind. Right? Go back to Proverbs chapter 11. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Sometimes, as Christians, we need to help those that are hurting, and, and we forget that. You know, the old IFB, I grew up old IFB. I've been in a lot of different types of churches in different states, under different pastors, and the old fundamental movement is self-destructing because instead of pointing their guns outward, fighting the homos and going after and saving souls, they're pointing their guns inward. Well, did you see what so-and-so posted on Facebook? Yeah, I don't know. We should, I'm gonna, you know, you know they're, they're fighting on the inside. And I thank God that our church does not have a big problem with that. I thank God that we come to, we use Facebook for our own good. We use YouTube for our own good to encourage each other, to exhort one another, to try to build each other up. But we need to recognize that there are a lot of people that don't understand the damage that social media is doing. And it's our responsibility to not be a tail bearer with them, not be hurting people. We need to try to build people up. That's our responsibility. Look here, Proverbs 11. Look at verse number 13. A talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. Would you rather be known as a talebearer or one of a faithful spirit? If you knew that there was a brother in here that had a weakness, let's say you found out they're sinning by not being sober. And it's not to the point that they're a drunkard, but you catch them, you see some, you heard of some, you, you picked up on something. Is it your job to go around the whole church and just gnash on them with your teeth? 
Oh, well, did you know so and so? Oh, I'm t hey, did you? Hey, be careful around them. Why? Oh, well, let me tell you. Right? That's what people do. It's like they put a little bait out so they can stir something up. And that's a talebearer reveal of secrets. But somebody that's of a faithful spirit can steal up the matter. If you found out something like that about somebody, what should you do? You should pray for them. Man, go to them. Say, man, maybe I'm wrong, but I think I, I, I sensed this. I think I saw that. If I'm wrong, please forgive me, but I just want you to know if it's true, I'm praying for you. I want to see you overcome that sin and have victory in your life. Instead, what's the flesh want to do? It wants to be a talebearer. wants to gnash on people with their teeth. Look at verse 14. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. And look, there is a time when you see red flags, you need a multitude of counselors. Right? That, that situation we had on, sun, on Sunday, it's good that other people said, hey, uh, something's weird there. It's, this lady's not quite right. Something's weird. It's good that this information was relayed for the safety of our children. Right? That's our job. So we have to find that balance, and we're only going to know it through prayer. But there's many applications to this verse. Where no counsel is, the people fall. You think about how, how ridiculously large our bureaucracy of a government is. Right? And they have many, many counselors. And they don't just make a decision. They don't just go in and say, yes, the road sign will be green. They do a study. They hire a third party. They vote on it three different ways. They set up test sites and take pictures. They do all these things. And then finally, they'll make a decision. You know what I mean? And, and we as Christians, we should do the same thing. When there's a big decision in life, you need to talk to somebody. You need to reach out to somebody you know you can trust and ask them for help. He says, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety in big decisions it, it requires much praying and much counsel to make sure you're doing the right thing and and it's good that there there are people in here of different walks in life that you can say hey I, I you know should I should I try this health thing or should I try this financially or should I try what about this house do you think this is right or wrong and it's it's good that we can help each other you know it, it makes me think about when when pastor Romero sent me out here when the whole situation happened with our church here before it was a church Pastor Romero wasn't quick to lay hands on me and just send me down the road. He talked to many counselors. He talked to many different pastors. Well, let me tell you the situation. Let me tell you about the people that are there. Let me tell you what's going on. Let me tell you about Brother Fan. Let me, what do you think? What would you do? Do you think I'm, I'm seeing this right? And, and through much counsel, he made the decision to start this church. Through many pastors. And praise the Lord, through the multitude of counselors, there's safety. Through the multitude of counselors, there is much spiritual growth here in Jacksonville, Florida. And man, I'm excited for this year. There's a lot of opportunities at our doorstep that we do not yet see. Now look, things are changing. Things are changing and it's okay. God has gotten us through to this point and he's going to keep on getting us through. No matter what happens, I believe it's of God that this church is here and that it's blessed by Him. He's going to take care of all the details. We just need to trust Him and be faithful and be upright and maintain our integrity. Look at verse 15. He that is surety for a stranger shall smart for it, and he that hateth suretyship is sure. What he's saying is, it's not smart, it's not wise to be a cosigner. It's not wise to make a promise on someone else's behalf. Right? You shouldn't even forswear yourself, let alone someone else. Right? Oh, I promise Marcel will be there. He can't be there. Right? You know, so you, you, and you don't go and put yourself in debt for somebody else. He that hateth suretyship is sure. If you hate credit and you don't want to be in debt, you probably have a really good credit score. If you think like, oh, I got a checkbook. Woo, it's free money. It's just I can write whatever I want. I can charge whatever I want. You probably have a really bad credit score. You know what I'm saying? If you hate sure, I hate credit, I hate debt, I don't want to be in debt to my eyeballs, then your credit score is going to get a little bit better. Look at verse, verse 16 here. A gracious woman retaineth honor, and strong men retain riches. Now this is an interesting verse because we're talking about financial things here now. Having counsel, having safety, being surety, which is a financial term. Having suretyship is sure. And then he goes into talking about honor. Now understand, in the Bible, the word honor is often used about money, about riches, about the financial blessings you have. Because if you look at the, the verse here, it's not comparing one to the other, it's complementing it. Let's look at it again. Verse number six, a gracious woman retaineth honor, and strong men retain riches. So what's the application of honor here? It's talking about riches. There are many other verses I could point to that use the word honor in the place of 
financial blessings. One is 1 Timothy 5 where it says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. It's saying, hey, it's okay to pay the pastor. If he's working and doing the things, it's okay to pay the people doing the work, right? The workman's worthy of his reward. But the part here about a gracious woman retaineth honor, why don't you think about this, right? Strong men retain riches. That's not just saying I can lift a lot, I'll be a rich man. No, he's talking about your own strength and control over your own spirit. Strength and control over your own desire. Somebody that's not just a binge spender, they're going to retain the riches. Somebody that's in control of their life and their budget, they will retain riches. Well, the same thing with a woman. A gracious woman, it says, retaineth honor. So think of that as riches. The mom that doesn't spend all the money on the, on the, on the junk food, right? Oh, I blew the budget on junk food. Sorry, there were no veggies this week. No, no steak, right? If, if, I'm telling you, steak and junk food is about the same price, you know? Forsake the chips and get the steak. You'll be better off healthy-wise, right? But I think that's the application here is that a smart mom doesn't spend all of her money on frivolous things because that's poor leadership. Good leadership is to think through what you're doing, think about the end game, think about the end of the budget, and try to make sure it all works. And then you can retain some of those riches. It's not just gone. Think about it. Look at verse number 17 here. The merciful man doth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. There's blessings for showing mercy, especially in leadership. When you have the opportunity to be merciful to somebody, you ought to. I, <laughs> I gave Naomi an opportunity of mercy the other day. She deserved a correcting, and I said, okay, look, you can make it right, and you won't get corrected. What do you want to do? Okay, so she decided to make it right. She went in, and she just stopped. She didn't do what she was supposed to do. Okay, come on, let's go get that correction. Okay, she knew it. She knew it, you know. I, I gave her mercy. I was trying to teach her a lesson. And at other times, it does work. Okay, thank you. I'll spare. I don't want that correction. I'll go do the right thing. Hey, you're learning. That's the goal, right? Look at verse, uh, verse 22 here. As a jewel of gold in a swine snout, so is a fair woman which is without discretion. This verse for... Uh, a long time makes me think of, of a, a fair woman in particular. I, there was this uh, friend of, of, a friend of a family, friend of my sister's we used to know. My brother and I used to joke about her. And everybody thought she was really good looking. But I thought, man, when she opens her mouth, it's like the stupidest things. I don't want to be around her. I can't stand her voice. I don't even want to know her. It's just like, right? As a jewel of gold in the swine's house, so is a fair woman that is without discretion. Which is funny because I saw this person 10 years later and I mean they had she ruined her life she was a fool but the discretion the word discretion think about the difference about how a cat goes to the restroom versus how a dog goes to the restroom right what's a woman acting like a pig it's how a dog just drops his business on the lawn and who cares who's watching right what's somebody with discretion true beauty like a cat Who's looking? Let me bury this. Nobody look. I don't want you to find it. Right? That's discretion. You should be discreet and know when to open your mouth and know when to shut your mouth. Right? Yeah, that's right. Look at verse number 24. Well, you know, it, it said we read, if, uh, there's a time to speak, a time to keep silence. You know, I think that would apply there. All right, verse 24, it says, there is, and he, he changes gears again, but he's still talking about physical blessings. There is that scattereth, and yet increaseth, and there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. Right? So imagine the church that withholdeth the gospel, the seed of the word. Well, we're not going to go out preaching the gospel. We'll just put tracts. We'll invite them. If they come in, they might get saved. We say, no, go everywhere, preach to everybody, give it indiscriminately, knock on every door, every, throw your seeds everywhere you can. Right? That's our goal. And why? It says, there is that scattereth and yet increaseth. How do we get more people saved? We put more seed out. We open the Word of God more. We preach the Word of God more. And we will increase. He says, the liberal soul, verse 25, the liberal soul shall be made fat. And he that watereth shall be watered also himself. Now look, this isn't talking about, you know, fat cat Democrats. Okay, don't get the wrong idea here. When he says liberal, that means freely giving. When he says fat in the Bible, it often means healthy, okay? There is fat bones is better than somebody starving to death where you can see their bones, right? So somebody that's healthy is saying, if you're giving away 
then you're going to be healthy. You're going to be better off. Versus, what are you saying? He said, he that watereth shall be watered also himself. The more you water other people, the more people are just going to water you. They're going to give back to you. It's more blessed to give than receive is what this is essentially teaching. Uh, it, it talks about in the New Testament, the liberal distribution unto the saints. You say, well, I have a bounty I've given to you. Go do God's work. Right? And that's the attitude we ought to have. That's the, that's the only acceptable form of liber liberality, okay? <laughs> Look at verse 26. Same concept. He says, He that withholdeth corn, the people shall curse him, but blessing shall be upon the head of him that selleth it. This ought to make you think of Joseph, a very wise man, a very great leader, a man that feared God, that led in the right way. He had corn, he gave it away. Oh, there's a famine, we're just going to sit on it. Daddy, I'm hungry. No, you're not allowed to eat. But we have food. I don't care, I'm worried about tomorrow. Well, feed him tonight. You know what I mean? God's going to continue to provide for us. And too many times people get a scared mentality and, and they're not distributing as they ought to. Look at verse number 29. He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind, and the fool shall be servant to the wise of heart. He's talking about a good leader. As a leader, don't trouble your house. Think about it. You don't, you don't just go and start fights and then leave, and you don't start fires and then, you know, make it somebody else's problem. And, you know, even with extended relatives, you shouldn't just, you know, well, I, I heard you guys were drinking. I'm never talking to you again. Well, you know, you should say, hey, we don't want to be around it. We love you guys. I hate drinking. I, you know, there's, there's a, a way to handle certain situations, and you don't want to trouble your house if you can avoid it. It says, if you trouble your own house, you will inherit the wind. You can't hold the wind, can you? There's nothing there. If you're, if you're provoking your children to wrath, you'll inherit the wind. They're going to hate you. They're, they're not going to love you. They're not going to take care of you when you get old. He says, and the fool shall be servant to the wise of heart. It's important as a leader to make sure you keep your house top priority. Make sure your family comes first. That is your number one priority. As a dad, as a mom, a wise woman builds up her house, right? The foolish plucks it down, right? As, as a man, we go out and work and we provide. We, we make our, our, our work fit for ourselves in the field, right? And then we build our house. You know, we, we got to make sure we're taking care of business so that our family is good. Why? So we can be soul winners. So we can be Christians. So you can raise a generation of Christians. Look at the next verse. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. The goal is to be a leader that will help further the cause of Christ. The gospel, the kingdom, the great commission, raising up children to be soul winners, putting your house first in God's order. Okay, so God's first and His Word tells me I need to take care of my wife, first of all. And then my children. I need to make sure my boss is right. I need to have a good relationship with my neighbors, my co-workers, if you, employees, right? All, and having all that in order. In 1 Timothy 3, it talks about of a pastor. It says, one that ruleth well his own house. And he goes on, why? So he knows how to take care of the church. Right, that's the example, that's the standard for all of us, is knowing how to rule our house. Look at, the, look at verse 3 where we started. Proverbs 11, 3. The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. Listen, I, I've worked for a company before that this guy, this guy was a pervert. I found out over time. And he destroyed the company. He destroyed people's lives. He was a wicked, wicked person. And he destroyed his own family. And, and you know, God will judge him. And I don't want to be like that, boss. I look back at that and I think, well, thank God I went through this terrible experience so I can say when I'm a boss, I don't want to be like that boss. And I wasn't. When I, was a, I left his company and started my own many years ago, and I thought, I don't want to be like this guy. I want to be upright. I want to be honest. I want to have integrity. I don't want to cheat people and laugh about it behind their back. I want to do the honest thing even if it's hard. I want to work for a fair price, and that's okay. God will make it all work. The integrity of the upright shall guide them. The goal for this year is that you would determine, I'm going to have integrity, I'm going to be upright, and that will give me grace with God. I will be in God's will, and that will guide me through the storms of life. That will guide me when I have a decision to make. I've already decided I'm going to do the right thing. I don't care. You know, I mean, <laughs> you don't steal. It's never acceptable. You don't lie. It's never acceptable. When you cast yourself doing things that are wrong, you fix the problem. 
And we as Christians need to learn that because you know, we always lie, we exaggerate, we say things that aren't totally true, we're a little bit of a tail bearer, and we need to find these things in ourself, in our own life, and try to get them better, try to get them right, and God will bless us. The integrity of the upright shall guide them. My goal for this church this year is that we all become better leaders by being better followers and having more integrity in our life. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would bless and just protect this church. Lord, thank you for everything you've given us in this past year, 1,100 souls saved. Lord, I pray that you would lead us on to bigger and better things. And Lord, when the storms come, 